You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. I'm very happy once again to have back on the Goldstein on Gelt show, Tom Woods. Tom is a best-selling author. He's written 11 books. We spoke last time about his book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History. We looked a little bit at American history. He's got another book called Meltdown. And in that book, Tom, you described the financial crisis in 2007 uh, to, to 2010 in accordance with what's known as the theory of the Austrian School of Economics. Could you explain to our listeners what that's all about? Well, the so-called Austrian School of Economics is gaining uh, tremendous traction in the United States and to a lesser extent in, in Europe these days, in part because economists who belong to it, and, and of course the, the Austrian School, it's not a physical place, it's a school of thought, and it's only tangentially related to Austria. But it it the, economies, the, the economists who belong to that school vastly disproportionately to their numbers predicted this financial crisis. So that's why suddenly this school that has been very much out of fashion is suddenly attracting a lot of interest. How, how did they know? I mean, did they, are, are these just uh, uh, soothsayers? Like how, how could they have predicted that this would happen? So the Austrians, by and large, what, what they're saying that's relevant to us now is that when you have these central banks all over the world, like the Federal Reserve System in the U.S., when you have them intervening in the economy and pushing interest rates lower, supposedly to stimulate economic activity, it, it does stimulate some types of economic activity, but not activities that are sustainable in the long run. They, they in effect, encourage entrepreneurs to make investments that they wouldn't have made otherwise if, if interest rates weren't so low. So it causes resources to go into channels where they wouldn't normally have flowed. And what the Austrian theory shows is that this this creates this sends the economy onto a path where it's it's configured incorrectly. Like it's it it's consumers are demanding more consumer goods, but more and more resources are being plowed into long term capital goods. So it 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 sure it encourages activity, but it's not activity for its own sake that we want in the economy. It's not jobs for their own sake that we want in the economy. It's production geared toward consumer wants. And that when you interfere with interest rates, you cause entrepreneurs and investors and consumers to commit errors, to do things they wouldn't have done. When you say interfere in interest rates, that is as opposed to simply letting the free market decide what interest rates should be? Exactly. I mean, ultimately, it's like any other sort of price control. If you interfere with the price of milk because you think you're helping things by lowering the price of milk, you're not because if you make you pass some law saying milk's going to be 10 cents a gallon, the result is going to be everybody's going to want milk and no one's going to supply it. So it's not enough to say that your intentions are good. So yeah, the, the, the free market ought to uh, just be let alone so that interest rates reflect people's savings and then when, when people save a lot, that's when interest rates are supposed to be low because people are deferring their consumption. That's when investment is supposed to take place. But instead what we have is people like Alan Greenspan, the former Fed chairman, in 2001 pushing interest rates downward 11 times. And the result was that instead of Americans correcting the errors of the past and saying, you know, we're, we're way too invested in housing, this is just crazy – Interest rates would have shot up on their own eventually, and, and people would have stopped speculating in real estate. They would have gone into something else. But when, when the free market was trying to give us some red lights, every light was green coming from Greenspan. And so people just persisted in these, in these errors so that when the crash came, the crash was much worse than it would have been if we had made the corrections sooner. Are there examples of countries where there is no central bank setting interest rate policy? 
Uh, to my knowledge, there isn't. I mean, there are some countries that more or less ape the U.S. Like, I don't think Panama has a central bank, but they're more or less using the U.S. currency, so their economy is deeply tied to the U.S. But basically today, no, more or less, every it has swept the board that you need to have a central institution that is in charge of money and interest rates. But what we in the Austrian school argue is that this is the heart of the economy. Half of every transaction is money. Money for hats, money for shoes, money for something. And when you interfere there, you are sending, uh, you're 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 creating a lot of white noise in the background. When people are trying to calculate, is this investment going to earn me a profit? Is this investment going to turn a loss? It becomes harder to calculate that when you've got all this white noise confusing your calculation. Well, it, it, it's a obviously a radical idea because no one's doing it. It's also kind of impossible just to test, isn't it? Well, we could let's let's give one one country a try. But what one thing that I've tried to show <laughs> How about show Saudi Arabia. It, yeah, well, it's, uh, sure. I mean, look, and if they prosper, then heck, we'll all, we'll all do it. We'll know that was the right thing to do. But what I show in meltdown is that when the United States had a major economic downturn in 1920 to 21, double digit unemployment, production down by 30 percent, just a disaster. It was not because the Federal Reserve pumped money into the economy that things turned around. The Fed was almost entirely absent in that crisis, and the federal government actually cut its budget in half. So they did exactly the opposite of what every stimulus-crazed economist today would recommend, and the result was one of the most robust economies the U.S. has ever seen. So that is some indication that uh, – this interference in the economy, all it does is blow up bubbles. It, it, it was a stock market bubble in the 1990s, tech stocks. It was a housing bubble in the 2000s. So if we want to do something about these bubbles, we could go after the institution that keeps pumping the air into them. Mm -hmm. We are talking with Tom Woods, who is the author of Meltdown. He's the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to American History, as well as the author of nine other books. He's previously been on the Goldstein on Geld show. If you missed the first interview, you can download a podcast of that at the radio shows tab of www.profile-financial.com. That's to hear Tom Woods, who's with, with us now for his second interview here. And I'd like to follow up with the next question, because you were mentioning the bubbles. Obviously, if we knew what the next bubble was about to be, it's kind of hard. Uh, we would try to make some money on the trade. But given the way the government's set up today, what could be done to avoid whatever that next bubble might be? Well, I, I would say right now, if investors aren't chastened by what's just happened to them, I mean, not only just over the past few years, but I mean, the S&P since 2000 has has barely recovered, if at all. So everybody should be cautious about the next big thing. And I would, I would just be careful about the Federal Reserve lowering interest rates and think and, and just thinking that that well I, I mean I, I don't know well, they can't lower it much saying. more it's I mean <laughs> yeah exactly I mean, at this point and and in fact it's not even so much because the Fed uh, is even pushing them down it's right just right now there's just no demand for for uh, for borrowing and for funds because in this atmosphere of uncertainty uh, nobody Nobody wants to expand. Nobody knows what the regime in Washington is going to do next. Nobody knows. They look at Europe and, and the, the slow motion collapse that's taking place over there. Very few people want to borrow in the first place. I mean you could throw the money at them. They don't even want to take it. Mm -hmm. Just use caution. Common sense. I mean, but for well, listen, say, people have to make a decision. Uh, let's talk a little more practically, right? You, you have cash. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, when you look back in the 1990s at what happened in the U.S., it's incredible. People are investing in companies that had no customers, no profits, no business plan. Just we've got a website and an IPO. And, and, and people thought they were going to get rich on this. Stop doing that. Yeah, I had clients who used to come in to me and say, uh, you know, I asked clients what type of investments they're looking for. And they said, oh, Doug, we're very conservative. We only buy the internet stocks because they're the ones that make money. So, I said, yeah, yeah, so that's not exactly. the definition of conservative. Yeah, no. Listen, at the end of the day, people have money. They need to put it somewhere. And if they put it into any current, like they put it into the bank, they say, well, this is FDIC insured, which I'm guessing that maybe you're not so uh, excited about. But they say at least that's safe. But yeah. of course, the drop in the dollar doesn't doesn't bode well for them, especially for people living outside the United States. And then they could buy right. treasuries, but they're getting downgraded. 
there's a limit. What what area could someone consider a safe investment today? Uh, well, I feel I'm, I'm just an amateur at this. I, I feel uh, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous about this, but I would say that uh, it's it's as crazy as this sounds. It's not necessarily uh, a silly idea to have some rental properties, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you if you happen to be able to lock in low interest rates on the rental properties. But well, people are going to need housing. That's one thing you know for a fact. Uh, and and people may not feel like buying houses anymore. But but this this is a kind of income stream that will that will come to you, and meanwhile you'll be paying the mortgage in depreciating dollars. And what I think people need to think about in retirement is not, hey, I'm going to have a big retirement portfolio that's going to yield me zillions of dollars. Because wh where's that going to come from? I mean, are you going to beat the market, really? Uh, where's that going to come from? The days of just throw your money in a mutual fund and it'll keep yielding 12 percent are over. What people need to think of instead is how can I generate uh, an income stream for myself in retirement, whether it's a side business or some properties or a subscription website where I can share some unique knowledge I have that people will pay for. Uh, things like that, I think, are are the way people need to think. They need to move out of the traditional thinking of, well, my pension will take care of me or I I'm listening to Dave Ramsey in the U.S. and he says just mutual funds will solve my problems. We have to think more creatively now. A lot of people are buying bonds just to get the income stream from that, which is and it's easier than buying a rental property. That's true, but I suspect that the well, it depends on what the bonds are. I think in some cases the the income stream is pretty low, mm -hmm. or if the income stream is high, that's because high risk. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and, and is that I mean if if this is what you're basing your retirement on, I don't know if I want to roll the dice in my retirement. I'd rather take slow and steady. And would you prefer to have something not in dollars, perhaps in something more solid like gold? I mean, I I do believe in 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 holding some gold and some gold stocks. I mean, over the past ten years, you've done pretty well if you've if you've been in those. But as I say, I'm I'm just a guy who I'm a historian who you know has just observed economies. Mm -hmm. I'm not a professional or an expert, but I you know I feel like I've got reason to have these instincts that we've. We're on the precipice of something, and I, I, to, to watch in Europe how they are desperately trying to hold things together does not fill me with confidence. So I want to have a portfolio that says uh, things are things could turn pretty drastic. Uh, uh, things could become pretty drastic pretty soon. I want to have something that's stable and solid. Okay. Okay. Again, uh, it's been a little bit depressing talking to you. We've been talking to Tom Woods. He was previously on the show here. You can download the podcast of the first interview at the radio shows tab of www.profile-financial.com. Uh, Tom, in the last minute, could you just tell people how they could continue to follow your work? Sure. Uh, at tomwoods.com, you've got all my, my blog and my writing and articles and uh, speeches and stuff, but also learnaustrianeconomics.com is a good resource for people who want to know what all the cool kids are saying about uh, economics these days. Great. Okay, Tom Woods, thanks very much again for joining us. Thank you, Doug. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.